appreciate that. Well, even though we're down a little bit, we do have an I Love My Church testimony. I originally had the poll labels for tonight, and of course, that didn't work out. And uh, so I talked to Jan Proke, and Jan graciously said she would give her testimony this evening about why she loves her church. And Jan, how long have you been coming to Bible Baptist now? Five years now. And uh, of course, she sings in the choir. And uh, helps out in nursery and also just does anything else that she can help with. She loves missionaries, uh, has opened her home to missionaries and uh, kept them there. Always willing to help out and be a blessing. And uh, we sure appreciate Jan Proke. And uh, she, uh, hard to believe, she turned 70. And I uh, hope I'm doing that well when I'm 70. And uh, that's, uh, that's tremendous. And uh, they're... And remember, on the 26th of this month, uh, no, the 29th of this month, a Saturday, uh, her family, her daughters are giving her a 70th party over in the Fellowship Hall from 2 to 5 on a Saturday. Just drop in and uh, bring a card. You don't have to bring a gift, but bring a card and uh, just let Jan know you appreciate her. And I think she'll enjoy that. All right, so that's Saturday the 29th from 2 to 5. But we're going to hear from Jan about why she loves her church. Let's sing our song together, and then we'll have her come. All right, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. All right, Jan, come right on. why I love Bible Baptist Church. It's, I've been in other churches where they talk about missions and supporting them, but this church goes far above it. And to be able to go on a missions trip to Mexico, it's an eye opener. If you haven't gone try and go this year it is a blessing um, and there's so many other places the nursing home we can always use if you don't want to if you just want to do it once a month or twice a month you know we'd love to have you it's very simple. We do a lot of singing, and there's always someone that gives the message. And the people in the nursing homes are very appreciated. They, uh, they open up our, their arms to us. They see us. They want the hugs. And that just means so much to them. So there are places anybody and everybody can do. And another, one of the other reasons is through all um, the surgeries and illnesses I've had this year, oh, I felt the prayers, the phone calls, text messages, anything. So this, besides my kids, this is my family. That's why I love my church. Amen. Very good. Well, let's go to in our hymnal to 228 together. 228, let's all stand together. As we sing, He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. Let's sing that first together. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. Yeah. 
that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my light in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus. shall not be moved he shivers me strength as my day he hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hides my life in the dead instruments are going to play a couple more stanzas. Great one another. Make somebody feel welcome. seated if you will great timing brother Paxton you got here in time for the offering amen that's that's perfect timing isn't it and uh, we're we said Sunday we're going to take in last week that this week's offering be for brother uh, Tim Booth the evangelist Booth who had the open heart surgery uh, in December and he's off the road for uh, probably three months or so and so what's that Bob Oh, okay. Yeah, the, uh, so anyway, we're going to do that tonight. We'll do it again uh, for Sunday at least. We'll let that be known because some folks want to give and they aren't able to be here tonight. 
uh, a couple of folks in the hospital told me they'd like to give and so uh, they'll they'll be able to do that on Sunday as well okay so we'll combine tonight and Sunday and send to Brother Booth just to try to be a blessing to him maybe pay some bills uh, that would be a help to them he's doing well uh, starting into his rehab now and uh, continue to pray for a full recovery for Brother Booth and if you if you still have postcards uh, from Sunday that you for the missionaries that you didn't bring back make sure you bring those back in Sunday if you would and get them in that little container back there you can just put them in there and uh, then we'll get them mailed out on the way to the missionaries okay all right let's pray for the offering father thank you for the privilege to give and lord we thank you for brother booth thank you lord for his ministry and the the many many times he's been a blessing to us here bible baptist church and lord i pray that you will allow us to be a blessing to him and to his dear wife and lord i pray that uh, you'll help those of us who can give to give and lord that you'll bless the gifts that are given and lord it'll be a truly a uh, an act of love and a, a lord a boost to both of them that there's people who pray for them and people who care about them and may you help supply their needs through us and i pray in jesus name amen Thank you, Nikki, for filling in and playing tonight. That's a blessing. All right, take your Bible and go to the Second Chronicles, book in the Old Testament, Second Chronicles, chapter seven. I thought we'd focus a little bit on revival as we prepare for our revival meetings with Evangelist John Hamlin coming up on Sunday, and it'd be good for us to look at this particular verse and this particular subject dealing with revival. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Let's pray together. Father, Add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here tonight and Lord others that will turn to this evening. But Lord, I pray that you will help us to understand and get a grasp and a better recognition and awareness of just what revival is. And Lord, we're not just asking for a corporate revival or a revival for our church or for our community. We, we bow before you tonight and I pray that each one of us would say, Lord, bring a revival to my heart bring a revival in my life and Lord help us to understand just what that is and how that can take place and bless our study here this evening in Jesus name we ask it amen Jerome Engel was a Baptist preacher and he was strolling along the seawalk at a church convention in Charleston South Carolina he saw a fisherman fishing and he sat down to watch him. The man made a catch and pulled in a pretty repulsive looking fish. It looked like a cross between a toad and a bullhead. Not knowing anything about fishing, Engel asked the man, What kind of fish is that? And the fisherman looked at him and said, We call that a Baptist fish, sir. And the man said, A Baptist fish? Yes, sir, replied the fisherman, throwing the catch back into the water. 
says, why do you call them that? He says, we call them that because they spoil so quick after you take them out of the water. They spoil so quick after you take them out of the water. Wow. America, churches in America, need a spiritual awakening. We need a revival. Now, I don't think that's just a nice option. I think we need a revival for our survival. If we're going to survive as a country, we need a revival. And the key to that spiritual awakening is in Second Chronicles 7 and verse number 14. To set the context, you have to understand that Israel has just completed Solomon's temple. It was a magnificent structure and took seven years to build it. And over 160,000 workers involved in the construction. You talk about a massive undertaking. It contains several tons of pure gold. It would just the gold alone would have been valued at over five hundred million dollars. You're talking about a magnificent structure. They had a dedication in chapter six and you know unbelievable amounts of sacrifices and animals that were sacrificed to God to show uh, their thanksgiving to God for what he had done and of course the fire of God fell and consumed them as burnt offerings and then the glory of God came down so thick upon that temple the priests couldn't even enter the temple to do what they wanted to do it was a week long celebration and a week long dedication of the temple and the, the things were going great the people were happy the, the, uh, everything was going well, and, and yet that's when God speaks to Israel. They have a week-long celebration. The sacrifice has been given. Now God's going to say something to the people, and he tells them in Second Chronicles 7. In fact, look at verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house he prosperously affected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. All right? So God is letting them know that if, if by the way, if I ever send the pestilence, if I ever send the locust, it'll, it'll be because Israel has gone away from me. And so what do, you, what do you do to stop that? What do you do to get the prosperity back? If you're my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God will, will heal their land. He'll forgive their sin. He'll heal their land. That, that's revival. Now understand, the word revival is not mentioned there. It actually comes from a word, re, which means again, and viver, which means to live, or to live again. Okay, That's what revival means. It means to live again. If, if a person has a heart attack, you give them CPR to try to revive them. Okay, Get them to live again. All right, and, and so a good definition in the spiritual context would be this. Revival is restoring spiritual vitality to a lifeless person, family, church, or nation. Restoring spiritual vitality to a lifeless person, family, church, or nation. Now you understand, it's something that's restored. It's revived. If you're going to 
restore spiritual vitality, you have to have one time had some spiritual vitality. If you're going to re, relive again, you have to have one time had life. Okay? You're not going to bring revival to a lost person. They just need vival. Huh. They just need life. Okay? They need to have life before they can get re-lifed again. All right? And so spiritual vitality will mean spiritual zeal. It means spiritual enthusiasm. It means fervor. It means excitement. And, and, and that's, what, that's what we need. People to be excited about the things of God. And people to be zealous for the things of God. And have the zeal of the Lord of hosts. And so, if you've ever see, if you've ever been more excited about God and the things of God than you are right now this evening, then you need revival. You need to be revived. You need that, that vitality brought back to you again that you once had. And, and God is able to do that. Someone said this, has anyone seen any signs of revival lately? Because that's becoming as rare as the reality itself. Not, I'm not talking about revival. Do we see even signs of revival? And the answer probably is no, we do not. And the problem is not that we don't, but we don't care. Nobody cares. We get consumed with the... Uh, preaching or the equipping the saints or the teaching or the activities. But who talks about revival? Who even mentions it anymore? And certainly, just, just like we have a Sunday to Wednesday, uh, Brother Hamlin will tell you, he remembers and when it would be a Sunday to Sunday meeting. Some of you remember when it would be not just Sunday to Sunday. You'd go a week and maybe you'd go another week. And there'd be two weeks of revival. Nobody does a week of revival, let alone two weeks. Very rarely will you have even a Sunday through Friday meeting. And therefore, few have ever said, or few can ever say, I've experienced revival in their lifetime. And just think about your life. Don't answer out loud. But have you ever experienced a revival? And where you really saw a moving of God? Not just where souls are saved. That'll be a result of revival. But revival is among God's people. Revival moves in the heart of God. And, and revival ought to be a movement of God that we seek. And listen, we have not because we ask not. Let's ask God for revival. A lady asked Billy Sunday, Why do you keep having revivals when they don't last? And Billy Sunday, in his own way, looked at her and said, why do you keep taking a bath? See? Because you, you need it continually. Amen? Uh, Stephen Alford said, Revival is an invasion from heaven that brings a conscious awareness of God. James Stewart said, Revival is the people of God living in the power of an ungrieved, unquenched spirit. Revival, Vance Havner said, revival is the church falling in love with Jesus all over again. That's revival. So let's, let's make sure. Revival, as we look at 2 Chronicles 7.14, and, and it's not, and understand, this is to the Jew, I understand that, but we can, I think, take the application from it for us today. And we can certainly glean from this, all right? And there's four ingredients I want us to take from this verse about revival. Four ingredients to revival. Number one, the first one is humility. Humility. If my people which are called by my name shall, what church? Humble themselves. Humble themselves. Humility means two things. First of all, it means dying to yourself. Dying to self. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. What does crucified mean? Put to death, doesn't it? When you're crucified, you're crucified for one reason. Somebody wants to kill you. Okay? So I am crucified with Christ. Humility and dying to yourself are inseparable. They go together. A.W. Tozer said, in every Christian's heart, there's a cross and a throne. And the Christian is on the throne 
until He puts Himself on the cross. If He refuses the cross, He remains on the throne. And that's probably at, at the bottom line of the backsliding and worldliness that we see in Christians today. Because we're not on the cross, we're on the throne. And we want to call the shots. Nobody's telling me what to do. Nobody's telling me how to live. I could do what I want. I don't want anybody telling me that don't judge me. You see? We want nobody telling us what to do. Nobody tell me what's right. Don't tell me what's wrong. I'm going to do what I want. Me and God got our relationship. I, I'm okay with the guy up there. See? I'm on the throne. I'm not on the cross. And if I'm not on the cross, then I'm on the throne. In other words, we want to be saved, but we want Christ to do all the dying. We don't want to do any dying. Andrew Murray put it this way, Many Christians fear and flee and seek deliverance from all that would humble them. At times they pray for humility, but in their heart of hearts they pray even more to be kept from the things that would bring them to that place. The very things that God may bring into our life that will humble us, we ask God to take them away. And God says those are the very things you need that you might be humble in my sight. So it involves a dying to self. That dying to self will result in an obedience to God. You won't, go back, you won't obey, you won't please God and please self. Okay? Yeah, the only two choices are on the, sh on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. Which one do you do? And so we're here to please God. Jesus, remember, as He came to earth, the Bible says in Philippians 2, He was obedient. He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death. Humbled Himself. So the first part of humility is dying to self. The second part is helping others to shine. In other words, it's helping others and building up others. Those who lack humility, which means they're full of pride, are often egotistical and very dogmatic. And that just reveals their sense of insecurity. They, they feel like if somebody else succeeds, then it's at the expense of their fame or their glory. By the way, that's why oftentimes, uh, honestly, that's oftentimes why uh, many churches never grow more beyond 50 or 75 people. Because... The pastor is very insecure. And he feels like if someone else begins to succeed, then he feels threatened. You know, I, I grew up in a church that, that, that literally ran thousands on a Sunday morning. But there was a pastor who had men of God on, the, on his staff that he allowed to have ministries. I mentioned when I was in the college and career class, we'd have 400 on Sunday morning. See, he, he let that man build a ministry within his ministry and didn't feel threatened by his success. Do you understand? You have to be able to not feel threatened by someone else succeeding. In fact, the Bible says, look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. I think I mentioned Zig Ziglar the other night, uh, the motivational speaker, and he said, you'll never get what you, you, the way to get what you want is help other people get what they want. You, you, you help build other people up, and you'll get built up. You help other people to do the will of God, and you'll do the will of God. And so, let nothing be done. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. It's so that the natural man wants to think they're better than everybody else. Everybody thinks that, 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 that I'm a little smarter, I'm a little quicker, I'm a little better than, than that guy is. And the Bible says that's not the way you ought to think. We want to think of others ahead of ourselves, and, and give them the benefit of the doubt. Listen to what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 9. I am the least of the apostles. Paul said in Ephesians 3, 8, I am the least of all saints. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's the Apostle Paul. 
Now, if the Apostle Paul says, I'm the least of the apostles, I'm the least of the saints, I'm the chiefest of sinners, where does that put us? That guy wrote half the New Testament. He, he, he's way above us. Well, who do we think we are? Unbelievable. I love this story, and I'll put it in here for us. Sportscaster, he's a former baseball great, Ralph Kiner, played for the Pittsburgh Pirates in another generation. But after a season where he hit 37 home runs, he went to the general manager of the Pirates named Branch Rickey, and he wanted a raise. Branch Rickey refused. And Kiner said, but I led the league in home runs. And Rickey asked him, where did we finish? And Kiner said, well, last place. And Ricky said, well, we can finish last without you. Boy, that's humbling, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. And no matter if you hit home runs, we finish last. We can, we can finish last without you hitting any home runs. And so that kind of puts you in perspective, doesn't it? You're familiar with the story in the New Testament in the book of Acts when Herod made a, made a speech and they all gave him praise and they all gave him glory and they said, it's not the voice of a man, it's a voice of a God. And Herod took credit for that. Remember what happened? God struck him dead and they saw worms come out of his body. Made up with worms because God's not sharing his glory with anybody. Here, think about this one. Tancredo Navis. He ran for president of Brazil in the 1980s. He boldly declared that if he got 500,000 votes from his own party, not even God could keep him from being president. He won the election, and one day later he had a heart attack and died. Nobody knows if God accepted that challenge, but we can be sure that you better, not be, you better be careful about making bold and arrogant statements because there's a God in heaven. First step is humility. Humility. Because the second ingredient is, if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and what? Pray. What, what the number one reason people don't pray is they're not humble. See, when you're pride, what, what's out of humility? Pride. Pride is, I can do this. I hate when I hear Christians say, you got this. I don't got anything. I, I, I hope God has it. And I'm trusting that God has it. And that God will help me to get it. But I don't got anything. Without Him, I can do nothing. I can do nothing. Prayer. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, Prayer pulls the rope below, and the great bell above rings in the ears of God. Some scarcely stir the bell, for they pray so languidly. Others give but an occasional pluck at the rope. But he who wins the heaven is the man who grasps the rope boldly and pulls continuously with all his might. James put it this way, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Jesus said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And that is asking and asking and asking. It's, hey, when's the last time, not did you pray, when's the last time you prayed fervently? When's the last time you prayed and you generated some heat or some sweat because you were praying so fervently to God? Maybe that's why we don't. Maybe we're just barely pulling on that rope. Barely pulling the bell of heaven. Like I said before, when, when people say, well, we've really prayed about this, I really want to ask them, what does that mean? Did you stay? How many nights sleep did you give up? How many days did you fast and pray? And pray and, and didn't eat? And get, committed yourself to prayer? David Brainerd, the American Indians came to kill him, and he was praying in the snow up in New England, and, and they stopped because as he prayed, 
He melted the snow in a circle around him. He was praying with such fervency for the American Indian. And they began to back away and go back to their huts, and they did not kill him. That's fervent prayer. See, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. R.A. Torrey said this some years ago. We sang a hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. He said, I wish we sang it more in these days. And R.A. Torrey was a hundred years ago. I suppose he could still say that today. You know what he said? It takes time to be holy. You cannot be holy in a hurry. Got that? You cannot be holy in a hurry, and much of the time it takes to be holy must go to secret prayer. Some people express surprise that professing Christians today are so little like their Lord. But when I stop and think how little time the average Christian puts into secret prayer, the thing that astonishes me, Tori said, is not that we're so little like the Lord, but we're as much like the Lord as we are. Because how little time we spend in prayer. D.L. Moody said, I'd rather be able to pray than be a great preacher. Jesus Christ never taught His disciples how to preach, but only how to pray. Someone said, there's more you can do after you pray, but there's nothing you can do until you pray. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, said the prayer power has never been tried to its full capacity. If we want to see mighty wonders of divine power and grace wrought in the place of weakness, failure and disappointment, let us answer God's standing challenge. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Dr. Rice, the great evangelist, of another generation said, all of our failures are prayer failures. All of our failures are prayer failures. See, fervent prayer produces phenomenal results. Fervent prayer produces phenomenal results. Prayer is the link that connects us with God. Prayer. Proverbs 15, 29, The Lord is far from the wicked, but He hears the prayers of the righteous. The great tragedy of life, listen, is not unanswered prayer. It's unoffered prayer. We have not because we ask not. I've never, ever had a Christian come to me in my office and say, Look, I just don't know what to do, Pastor. I'm so nervous. I'm so upset. I, nothing goes right in my life. I, I think I just spend too much time in prayer. I've never had anybody come and say, I need some help. I spend too much time praying. Never had that happen. But I've had scores of people come and say, I don't pray like I ought to pray. I just don't take the time to and I, and, I, and I don't pray. Most of us would, would admit that our prayer time, our prayer life is not what it ought to be. And we wonder why there's little, little prayer, little power. No prayer, no revival. Humble yourself and pray. Okay? So humility, prayer, number three, is desire. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. And what's next, church? Seek my face. Seek my face. Psalm 27 and verse 8. The psalmist wrote this. When thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Marcus Aurelius Antonius said this. It's a great quote. The true worth of a man is to be measured by the objects he pursues. The true worth of a man is to be measured by the objects he pursues. Do you pursue God? Do we seek His face? 
You're in Second Chronicles 7. Turn over a couple pages to chapter 15, would you please? Second Chronicles chapter 15. Notice verse 15. The Bible says, And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought Him with their whole desire. And He was found of them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. The problem, listen, the problem is not that we're too passionate about bad things. It's that we're not passionate enough about the good things. Oh, we don't have a problem getting passionate about the, 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 the football game or getting passionate about something else going on in our life. But listen, where's our passion for God? Like Jehu who said, hey, come see my zeal for the Lord. Where's the folks who have zeal for God and a passion for God? And I, and I know you, you have to have some passion for God or you wouldn't be here tonight. You look out and see the snow coming down and you'd have said, forget this. <laughs> but you have some passion there and that's good. Let's have a passion for God. First Chronicles 16.11 Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His face continually. Do we, do we seek the face of God? A face-to-face -face encounter with God. A.W. Tozer again said, If we yearned after God as much as a cow yearns for her calf, we would be worshiping the effective and effective believers God desires we be. If we long for God as a bride looks forward to the return of her husband, would we not be a far greater force for God than we are now? Do we seek His face? Do we seek Him? Psalm 42, verse 1, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after Thee, O Lord. Did you ever just get thirsty for God? God said in the book of Isaiah, I'll pour water on him who is thirsty, and I'll pour floods upon the dry ground. You know, the Bible talks about to the hungry soul, everything is good. To the full soul, even the honeycomb is bitter. You know why? We get so full of other things, we don't have any appetite for God. We need to say, God, empty me that I can be of a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. A hunger and a thirst for the face of God. That's, that's why people stopped having revival meetings. You know why? Oh, people have so many other things going on. People have other things that take them away. You can't expect people to come to church five nights in a row. Too many other things that draw their attention away. Do you understand? We, we've lost the fact, hey, can I take five days out of 365 days to seek the face of God and to see God do something in my life? Shame on us. Shame on our church. So we see the desire. So we see humility, prayer, desire, and then number four is repentance. When you go back again to 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and then what's the fourth one, church? Turn from their wicked ways. I think it's always interesting. This, this verse has been quoted often in the three years that he's been vice president by Vice President Mike Pence. And Mike Pence, I, I pray and I, I believe he may very well be a believer in Jesus Christ. But Mike Pence is still a Catholic. And, and you know, when he quotes this verse, here's how he quotes it. If my people, which I call by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. He always leaves out, turn from their wicked ways you you go back and listen any tape you ever heard him where they have a him quoting that verse he'll never quote turn from their wicked ways but that's repentance and you're not going to have revival without repentance Corey Tinboom said an unrepented sin 
is a continued sin. An unrepented sin is a continued sin. Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. The confessing and forsaking is the repentance. It's a great, it's a great illustration. A man was praying with his pastor at the altar. And he prayed a prayer that evidently the pastor had heard him pray before. The man prayed, Lord, take the cobwebs out of my life. Take the cobwebs out of my life. And just as he prayed that, the pastor interrupted and said, Kill the spider, Lord. Don't just get the cobweb out. Kill the spider. So he can't make any more webs. Many times we ask God just to forgive us of some sin, but we leave the source of the temptation in our life. Then we're playing games with God. We're not serious about getting rid of our sin. Gordon MacDonald said, Repentance is not basically a religious word. It actually comes from the culture where their people were essentially nomadic and lived in a world with no maps or street signs. It's very easy to get lost when you're walking through the desert. You become aware that a countryside is strange and so you finally say to yourself, I'm going in the wrong direction. And that's the first act of repentance is to realize I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm wrong. Okay? The second act of repentance is to say, I'm going to go in a different direction. I'm going to turn around and go in an alternate direction. And not only do you do it, but you have to admit it. That's why Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord. For he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Ezekiel 18.31 Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Repentance when, and, and the confessing and forsaking of your sin. When, when somebody repents to be saved. The Bible says repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance, when I change my mind. Repentance means I realize I'm wrong. At some point, when you heard the gospel, you had to say to yourself, I'm wrong. I, I'm trusting in my good works. I'm trusting in a good life. I'm trusting in something I do. And I realize that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says Jesus is the way. I'm wrong. So now what do I do? I've got to admit I'm wrong, and I've got to be willing to go a different way and put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And, and the same thing's true as a Christian. Once I know that God says what I'm doing is wrong, if I repent of that sin, I repent of the sin, I, I admit I'm wrong, and then I go a different direction. And I don't, bring the, I don't bring the sin along with me. Turn from their wicked ways. About face you turn away from them okay if if I'm with Xavier and I turn from Xavier what do I do I'm turning away from Xavier just as we turn away from our sin if you don't turn away from your sin your sin will get you your sin will pull you back in William Mason said, this is good, if we put off repentance another day, we have a day more to repent of and a day less to repent in. Did you get that? If we put off repentance another day, we have a day more to repent of and a day less to repent in. Turn from their wicked ways. This isn't for the lost. God's not telling the lost world, turn from your wicked ways. They certainly have wicked ways, but they're lost. This says, if my people 
which are called by my name. That's us. Are we God's people? Are we called by His name? Absolutely. We're Christians. Take the name of Jesus with you. We do. We're Christians. Christ once. So this is for us to turn from our wicked ways. Turn from pride. Turn from selfishness. Turn from self-righteousness. Turn from gossip. Turn from worldliness. Turn from unfaithfulness. You know what God says He'll do? Then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive your sin. And I'll heal your land. God will heal. Hey, that's true of a nation. It's true of an individual. It's true of a church. God says, I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive your sin. And I'll heal you. What a... You know what that'll be? Revival. That'll be revival. One time, one time in my, this is my 38th year being a pastor, one time I've seen genuine revival. We had a two week revival meeting. And really it was longer than that because we had, I made up little cards about that size. And I had on that card, consecrating myself to God and praying for revival. I will turn off my television from the week before the revival, the two weeks during the revival, and the week after the revival. And folks signed the card, turned it in. We, we set ourselves apart. And we had an evangelist in to preach, and the first week, we didn't have anybody saved, but boy, we had Christians getting right with God. It was not unusual for the service to be over at 8.30, but it would not be unusual to have people praying and weeping in the auditorium in different Sunday school rooms until 11, 11.30, 12 o'clock at night. Every day the evangelist and I met. We didn't go out soul winning. We met in my office and turned the lights out and laid prostrate on the floor and we prayed and ask God to work in people's hearts. And boy, unbelievable things. Then that second week came, and people started coming. We ended up seeing 95 people saved during that meeting. But that wasn't the first week. That was the second week. And we saw God do some, some we saw revival. It was incredible. And that, that was 1987. Never forgot that. It was an amazing time. But you understand, God responds to what we do. We want to we wanna do everything ordinary and want God to do the extraordinary. But if, if we want God to do something special, then we need to do something special. If we want God to do something different, then we need to do something different. Then we need to say, okay, God, I'll consecrate myself. I'll set myself apart. Will you, will you, would, you, would you give up your television for the revival next week? Would you give up uh, things that would, would distract you and give that time to God so you could see revival, so we could see revival come to us personally? I remember during the Welsh revival, a, a man traveled to, to Wales, and he asked, stopped the policeman, and he asked, where is the Welsh revival? And the policeman said, the Welsh revival is right in here, sir. That's where the Welsh revival is. And that's what, I, that's what we ought to say when the evangelist comes to Bible Baptist Church and somebody says, where's the revival? You should say, you know what, the revival's right in this heart right here is where the revival is. And that's where we should ask God to bring it. R.A. Torrey said, the best way to have a revival is draw a circle on the floor and then step inside the circle and then ask God to send a revival inside that circle. He will. If my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. That's revival. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, 
I pray you'll take the truth here this evening. Help us, Lord, to take these ingredients that you gave to Israel, but certainly can apply to us. May we humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. And Lord, I, I see so easy how that, that, that flows one to another. If we humble ourselves, it will drive us to prayer. And the prayer drives us to seek your face. And when we see your face, it will cause us to turn from our wicked ways. Lord, we love you. We want you to do something in our lives. We really want revival. We want to see it in our lives, in the life of our church, in the life of our city, in the life of our nation. Help us, God. Send a great revival to my soul. I pray you'll hear our prayer tonight hear our prayer that will be made over these next several days as we prepare for these special meetings we've set aside and ask you to send us a revival to our souls. Thank you for each one that's been here tonight, God. I pray that you'll watch over them now as they travel home, help them to be safe on the streets. And Lord, if you tear your coming, bring us back for our meeting on Sunday, and we'll thank you for it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Obviously, there's no choir practice tonight, so choir, you get the night off. And uh, hallelujah for that. And uh, be careful going home, all right? Let's, you, can you count every day with Jesus? Here we go. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. God bless you. You're dismissed.